because at the beginning they will be all very friendly and it's like a couple of months and you will start hearing, you're stealing our jobs. I was talking about this to students uh, in České Budějovice uh, last week and I said, I repeated this and they said, they're already saying it. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and also, I don't know, uh, I had a little uh, talk about all this. I don't know whether uh, South Bohemia is particularly kind of nasty. Uh, Mr. Schlerka, some, somebody told me that it was originally a kind of communist bastion, was it? Uh, uh, so apparently uh, there was a lecturer in the, these classes uh, from Sobieslav, I think, and he said that, um, that the local people there are absolutely against the refugees. There are too many Ukrainian flags here. We want to show our Czech flags. Anyway, I am um, uh, want to refer to this um, uh, of public opinion poll of STEM from the 19th of uh, April 2022. So it seems to be very encouraging because it says that um, there are only 4% of Czechs who have a positive attitude to Russia to put in. Mm -hmm. um, the Russian invasion to the Ukraine uh, brought a best precedented feeling of uh, being threatened to the Czechs. Only 9% of the Czechs think that Central Europe isn't threatened by a conflict. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also, Czech society now believes in NATO. 78% of the population agrees with the Czech Republic being in NATO, which is the highest share since 1994. Also, most Czechs think that EU should uh, work on uh, um, supporting uh, Ukraine militarily by uh, sort of uh, military equipment and find gas and oil elsewhere, elsewhere than in Russia. But, so, so, and even two months after the beginning of the attack uh, uh, in Ukraine, Czech society still on the whole uh, displays high solidarity with Ukraine. Two thirds, 64% of the Czech public approve uh, the reception of Ukraine refugees, but still 64%, I bet it doesn't seem to me, but what about those other 46%, right? But why am I talking about it is, um, why this is that there are signals of destabilization is Czech public is also afraid. Two thirds, seventy percent of the Czechs are now afraid that their what the, the communists used to call social certainties will be eroded, that they will basically lose their jobs, whatever. And fifty-two percent of Czechs are convinced that the presence of the Ukrainian refugees will uh, lead to higher unemployment. Mm -hmm. Which is, of course, rubbish, because we all know that usually uh, refugees are incredibly active. And if you look at what happened in Germany after accepting those million ref uh, Syrians, it actually uh, boosted the economy. But of course, th there are all these. So anyway, um, I did an interview. Oh, one other thing I wanted to uh, uh, Czech Republic has a serious problem with uh, the bailiffs. In about 2000, and the Czech uh, president, Miloš Zeman, uh, was kind of connected to this, and weirdly the Social Democratic Party was kind of involved in it. In, in around 2000, they introduced a law making bailiffs um, uh, private entrepreneurs, right? The ba bailiffs are... Bailiffs like people who what happened, and it's uh, you go on public transport, do not pay the 20 crowns, mm -hmm. uh, you, you are caught by an inspector, this is registered, five years nothing, uh, for five years nothing happens, in five years you lose your house, because this, this is passed on to a private bailiff, uh -huh. and they are free to put on absolutely exorbitant charges on this, yeah? Um, so uh, a debt of 20 crowns will ter can turn into millions, right? Now, um, 
this there's been quite a discussion about this but uh, and some people are saying that this was what happened in 2000s or whatever up to about 2010 or whatever and now that that situation where from a totally minuscule debt you will lose your home uh that uh, uh that doesn't happen so often right there are various other uh, issues connected with this. We were once affected with this uh, in, in British Real Estate, where, where, uh, where, I don't know, there was, a, uh, there was a former collaborator and he had a mobile phone, which we paid for. And uh, there was a debt of about 600 crowns, which is about 20 pounds. Uh, about three years later, our account was blocked and they wanted 60,000 crowns <laughs> for this, right? So uh, we had to obviously pay, pay for it, but this is now. Apparently, the situation uh, is getting better. Mr. Schlerka, I don't know. I did an interview with Radek Habel last night, who's broadcast today. Radek Habel is a specialist who uh, sort of deal with these, these issues. And he actually says that the number of these bailiff procedures over the past year has grown by 11%. Right, and the Czech Republic has uh, 10 million inhabitants, one and a half million people in this country are affected by this. Right, and he was actually saying that uh, quite a lot of people have multiple uh, impositions of, of these bailiff procedures on them. Right, so. Uh, what happens? These people, these these people's uh, bank accounts are blocked. They have to go into the uh, sort of black economy because they no longer. It really, 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 it is really problematic. But why I'm talking about it, about it is um, it destabilizes the political situation in this country. Okay, uh, it has been found that. Uh, the, 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 these, these afflicted people are mostly in poorer areas, northern Bohemia, northwestern Bohemia. Um, there are regions which vote for the populists. I don't know whether you're aware where there is this uh, semi-Japanese immigrant here called Tomio Okamura, and he runs this SPD party, which is an, uh, paradoxically and uh, uh, blatantly anti-refugee and basically fascist fascist party, he's a deputy, uh, he is still, is he deputy? Oh, he's no longer deputy in parliament, but he was, okay. yes. He was. Oh, right, because then there was the election, yes, yeah, okay. <laughs> they get about 10% of popular support in this country, right? Um, one other thing that uh, Mr. Harbour was saying, but of course, this is not only a problem in the Czech Republic, Last week, the Daily Mirror in Britain ran an absolutely shocking uh, headline on the front page. 23% of Brits can't afford to heat their homes. 23%, right? Incredible grow, uh, uh, rise of uh, energy prices. He, he was saying to me yesterday that uh, actually, what was it? Um, I think one square... Uh, uh, meter of gas used to cost 25 euros. Now it costs 100 euros, but of course uh, it goes up to 250 euros, right? Now Czech energy companies so far have uh, supplies. They, they've had, uh, they've stored gas so, so that this hasn't afflicted people yet, but it will in the autumn, right? So there will be rises in the prices of energy and everything of hundreds of percent. Now, this has already happened in Britain. Uh, in France, apparently, this hasn't happened because Macron uh, taxed the uh, energy companies. And so, so it hasn't been such a problem. But here, accept, uh, expect absolute destabilization of society. Uh, he was also saying that, I mean, if uh, th there is a 13% inflation in this country right now, there um, people uh, became, quite a lot of people became impoverished in this country due to COVID. There was 9% uh, of people living uh, in poverty here. Now it's about 16%. But the impact 
of uh, the Russian invasion hasn't as yet been registered because as he explained, these bailiff procedures take about a year, right? You first have to get into debt, then you, you uh, then it waits and whatever, and then about two years later, it happens, right? So um, I fear, and Mr. Schlerka, what do you think? Uh, there is a, what people call a decent uh, right of center government in this country now. Uh, slightly, well, political scientist from Brno University, Peter Piala is the head, right? I, uh, this country is very small. <clears throat> Went to lunch to the head of my department in Brno. And he's actually a friend of Mr. Fiala. And uh, he, because he's obviously, he used to be the vice chancellor there and uh, he's the head of the uh, political, uh, political studies department there. And uh, he was telling me that Mr. Fiala is very nice. And that at one point he really fought for them for some grant or something like that. However, he says, He's not very effective, he said, right? I can see that I am, I am kicking into your castle because you had for many years here this horrible prime minister, populist Andrei Babish, who's now becoming really quite populist. And now you've got this nice, decent person. Uh, and uh, however, they are doing something to help uh, these poor people. But then the, what? there was an election in October which was won by this sort of coalition of five parties, most of which are right of center. There was this uh, pirate party, which was regarded as mildly left of center, but there were so many attacks in the pre-election period that they only got, what was it, four MPs in parliament in that coalition? I think so, four, yes, yes. So uh, there, there is one interesting thing. There, there used to be a fairly strong social democratic party here. They became really, if I may say so openly, quite fascist, frankly. They, they really kind of uh, decided that- um, Which party? Social democratic party. They really decided that they wanted to be anti-immigrant, Muslim, uh, anti-Muslim. There was this long fight whether, uh, <clears throat> Czech Republic should accept uh, uh, refugee children from the Middle East, from Syria. And there was this fight, this social democratic uh, uh, home secretary, Hamacek, was absolutely against it. They're going to be terrorists, these nine-year-olds and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it was like they were hoping that if they follow this populist line, that this would be popular. But all their, uh, all their voters were stolen by Andrei, Andrei Babish's Anno party, which was in government. And they had kind of mildly left-wing pretensions. So um, that in the elections here, there's this 5% limit. So that parties that don't get 5% uh, can't get into parliament. Social Democrats didn't get into parliament in October. There is no left-wing party in this parliament. One other interesting thing is there is no party which in the, in the Czech parliament, which would represent my, young people. I suppose this is a problem in many countries. But what other interesting point, Mr. Schlerka, uh, argue with me, if you will, um, the ruling political parties and the opposition are basically dominated by 50 to 60 year olds. Yeah. And uh, they don't give a damn about global warming, right? Because it what doesn't concern them, they're going to be dead, right? There is absolutely no representation of young people whose problem this is going to be, and they don't know what to do. But the main thing that, that I'm talking about is nice Peter Fiala, who ap apparently is not terribly competent. There are members of this coalition who are kind of making these statements. Uh, well, poor people, that's their own fault, isn't it? And we, uh, there was one, this woman, Pekarova, what's the name again, uh, who, was, who was saying, it is, not the, it is not the task of the government to take care of people, was something that, that she said uh, in parliament. And um, they are doing something, uh, small things. But I seriously fear that 
what is coming is going to hit this country very hard. And what will happen? You're going to have Poland and Hungary or whatever, and Putin's uh, aims will finally be realized here because he will destabilize Europe by uh, bringing these prices uh, so high and by these people who will be incredibly impoverished, they will vote in uh, these populists into power. And it's quite interesting. I don't think the current nice right of center government is realizing this, this unless they start behaving, they, unless they start really actually um, uh, fighting for people, this is going to be a problem. And of course, the former, uh, uh, Czech Prime Minister, that oligarch, Andrei Babic, who is actually uh, being sued for some fraudulent uh, business activity, um, and he's trying to be re-elected uh, elected president in, in the spring, he has now jumped absolutely on this kind of populist kind of note, and uh, he's putting on Twitter things like, well, the government is working for the Ukrainian refugees, but why isn't he doing anything for us, you know? So this is already starting and uh, uh, it will resonate amongst people. And uh, people are saying, I think uh, Daniel Prokop, a uh, very sort of well-known and very uh, efficient, uh, uh, competent uh, sociologist here, was saying the government must not tell people we all will have to tighten our belts. That's great. So, when I wanted to talk about this, I mean, already I've been talking for about 20 minutes. Um, Andre uh, mentioned that I've been doing this uh, uh, sort of website uh, for almost 30 years now. Um, about this stereotyping, this is slightly, uh, well, old hat because the situation has changed. But nevertheless, I would say that the country is still um, suffering from it. The personal experience, uh, Briskelisti started, well, when I started editing it in the mid nineties, I had lived in Britain for about 20 years and actually had some experience with uh, journalism and actually, I don't know, was fairly aware of the fact that democracy thrives if you have critical hard hitting uh, journalism. And this was very difficult to put through uh, in, uh, in the context of the Czech Republic, because the 90s in particular, um, many Czechs were absolutely enamored of this new, newly uh, created, what they saw as glossy capitalism. And you were not supposed to criticize it. And if you criticized any moves by the government, you were a bloody communist. Okay. And because we criticize the government, we uh, uh, received this kind of, and this is this stereotyping, this kind of thing that you, they're really bloody communist in British Galist, this is, you know. And then of course they, they, they were kind of surprised that actually not, that that's, uh, anyway, this, this doesn't work because there were different views of the world. Um, what I have experienced is, and I think this still happens uh, to this very day, and I suppose maybe it happens in other countries as well. Um, you are putting out certain messages and there are subliminal memes within it, which for, for people are actually signals, which seem to be a fraction of something, some attitude that they kind of think is typical. So that, I mean, like, as I'm saying, you criticize the government and the communists criticize the government, so you're a communist. And it is extremely difficult to fight against this because people will make your judge, make their, their judgments and then you are, you are put into this pigeonhole and you remain into, in this pigeonhole forever, right? I've got this um, example. I, I do not want to identify herself with fully, but there is this French historian uh, called, uh, her name is Muriel Blade. She did, made this mistake in the 90s or late 80s that she started studying Central Europe, which then she discovered France doesn't give a damn about. So actually there wasn't a career for her there. Uh, she worked for some years in uh, some kind of East European uh, Research Institute in Vienna, which was later abolished. Uh, and she became a member of this Czech um, Uster, Ustav pro Studium Totalitnich Režimu, the study 
uh, the, the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes. Uh, I always say, and I'm not the only one, that this is a ridiculous name, why? Well, you see, if you are an academic, you only set out to study something and you determine that it is something. But this institute knows already that those regimes were totalitarian, right? So it's very uh, interesting. But anyway, uh, Professor Blev has been uh, trying to study uh, every day life under communism here. And she pointed out which is not, and anyway, this is what historians do in other East European countries. They pointed out that actually what happened under the authoritarian communist government was that people were both victims and collaborators, which is, and, and she actually in various interviews, she pointed out, this is what was the case, say, in France during the Nazi occupation. This, this notion that, uh, uh, that basically people were heroically fighting Nazism in France is absolute rubbish. And similarly, and you know, and again, Mr. Schlerka, I would like you, your view about this, but uh, there is this very strong anti-communist kind of uh, movement here, whatever, which is fairly weird, as she points, it, points out, because it's about 32, whatever, 33 years since the fall of communism. And she's saying, well, uh, the Second World War ended in 1945. It would be amazing, 33 years after 1945 in 1978. It was absolutely, it would be absolutely amazing if 1978 uh, Czechs were obsessed with the Gestapo. Mm -hmm. But the Czechs, many Czechs are obsessed with the communists. Maybe it was because obviously the Nazis were definitively defeated in 1945. So, so it wasn't a problem in 1978. And the Communist Party left parliament only last year, whatever. But it. One other important thing is the, 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 the this, this anti-communists are actually saying, oh, danger, communist party, they will take over power again. They kind of don't realize that they only could take over power in this country because of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union doesn't exist, even though now, of course, we have, we have Putin and, and another danger. So anyway, she's been, uh, she's been pointing out that uh, the Czechs collaborated with the regime. They got uh, benefits for it. But of course, they were also victims. And uh, she, sa she says that this is very important to study every day. And uh, there is this, this anti communist kind of have created this kind of construction that communism was some kind of external affliction, right? So basically, it came from, I don't know, Russia or nowhere, and the poor Czech nation had to struggle against it, and finally, it survived. And she's pointing out, no, you were both victims and perpetrators. She's been branded a communist for this. But that's what Václav Havel also said. This is, this is quite interesting that, yes, Havel, Havel did write that actually you were always a part of the system. Yes, we, we, we were all part of it. Yes, yes. yes. But they... Also, we, we need to watch the clock here. Yeah, okay. Sorry, so anyway, five, what... Five, what? Five more minutes if you can okay, you can absolutely fine. Time. Yes. Uh, so anyway, I've, I've probably said mo most of the stuff I wanted to, uh, yeah. Yeah, those 5,000 articles I mentioned, <laughs> St. Kilda, and uh, yeah, misuse of history. There is no morality in history. Our past, says Czech historian Jan Riklik, another sensible person. Our past consists of a large number of events. History requires a chronological narrative. It is impossible to create such a chronological narrative without the selection of suitable historical facts. It only depends on us which facts we regard as important. Most modern European nations were formed in the 19th century. This is when these nations constructed their own national narratives. These are basically narratives about how great their national past was. A majority of citizens in each of these nations then identify themselves with such a narrative. This national narrative is then codified and set in stone by means of the teaching of history in schools. From the point of view of this narrative, the present looks like a logical outcome of the past. But since history does not have an end, the so-called contemporary history is gradually also being included into the received national narrative. However, this creates an insurmountable problem. When you try to construct a historical narrative using events which people have personally experienced and they remember them, these personal experiences are often in conflict with the attempts to create a, unite, a unified national narrative. 
The consensual assessment of recent history functions as a justification for the currently ruling power builders. But in order to create a historical narrative, you have to create an end, a happy outcome. But reality doesn't have an end. Let's bear that in mind. Thank you very much. Oh, no.